This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. Like any good product, you have to start off with, with an amazing cream. Like for us, it's the, the, the raw material that matters. So where we get our cream from matters a lot. Uh, so we can't just buy your average supermarket grade cream. So you need real cream. You need basically the stuff they skim off the top of milk at a farm. And to get that product, we, we have to go to the farmers direct. So for us, we, we have to source our cream very carefully. We travel a lot to different farms to make sure that the cream we're getting is the real deal from different areas of Australia. For more information, go to pepisayer.com.au. I found the best question I ever asked was, what do you normally like? And that gives you style and it gives you price. And then you can, it's not about me giving someone a wine that I like. It's about trying to recommend a wine that they they would like. Today on Dirty Linen, we are heading to country Victoria to speak to Troy Walsh, whose restaurant Le Bouchon at Atwoods uh, is doing some really lovely food. Oh, so I hear, (laughs) I can't pretend I've been there, but I'm going to come, Troy, I'm going to come. When I've encountered Troy in the past, uh, I have really loved uh, hearing his stories. He's had a lot of experience in hospitality, lived in London for ages, worked at some big name restaurants and he's got all the goss. Um, So I'm looking forward to catching up today. Welcome, Troy, to the pod. Thanks, Danny, for having me. It's really great to have you on the show. Um, Let's start with the present before we zip back in time. Tell us about uh, Le Bouchon at Atwoods. So Le Bouchon was um, sort of um, came to light just before COVID. So um, we have a winery um, just based outside of Glenline and um, the Masson Ranges. And we were looking at putting a restaurant into the cellar door and we happened to come across Sean Marshall um, who's an amazing chef who was living not too far away. And he and I sort of sat down and we chatted and we had quite similar philosophies on what style of food and style of service that we wanted to um, to do. And um, yeah, and we opened just before COVID. And tell us about the offering. If I come, when I come, what am I going to get? Yeah, so it's a set course menu. So it's a four course set menu with an option of a fifth course, our um, signature dish which is a poached lobster tail in black truffle butter served with a crustacean sauce. Yes, please, and, and, I will add that. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, Sean's background is he was also a very good sourcier at some great restaurants, so the sauces in, in the food are amazing with the food. So, um, And it changes monthly and seasonally, so we try and use as many vegetables from the garden, the vegetable patch that we have, um, and then we try to use as many local products as possible to create a, um, a, bi- a bistro, French bistro style um, dining. Fantastic. And, and the wine is obviously a big part of the experience and I really love Atwood's wine. I'm definitely not alone in that passion. Tell us about your approach to winemaking. So I did all, I was lucky enough to do most of my training in, in Burgundy. So the, the, the philosophy is to do as much of the hard yards in the vineyard so we don't have to do as as much in the in the winery we're trying to put um as light a thumbprint on the wine as possible so um we um try and guide the wines from that vintage to the bottle rather than forcing them so it's about taking time and not rushing things yeah and how would you say 2023 is shaping up it's been we, we do we've got uh, most of our vi- own vineyards are in Macedon or the Ballarat region, and so it's obviously quite cool climates. And for us, it's been a really great vintage actually. Um, we we've had long ripening periods, um, so the flavours and colours that we're finding this year are, are very are lovely, and lots of natural acid, which is good for us as well. Um, because we're not picking our f- fruit really ripe, we're trying to make wines that match with food, not just van de table. So we've been picking at sort of 12.8 Bome, which is about perfect for us. Um, so we're really excited about the, the, the vintage. And what's a dish and what's a dish with a match on the current menu that you just think really speaks to the whole project? Yeah, so 
at the moment, what, our, uh, something like the Amuse Bush at the moment is a beautiful French onion soup, and we're doing um, one of our um, Chardonnays, a, a, a Chardonnay that I made, um, a, a little bit experimental one. It was called Two Barrels, and it was a wine that two barrels of Chardonnay that I just didn't top for three years and then we bottled it and so it's got a bit more of that oxidative nutty character and I think it goes really beautifully with the uh, French onion soup. Oh yeah, I can just imagine the, the layering that there would be with those different flavour profiles. Yeah, because it's pretty bold at, at a mousse. Like French onion soup's got a, a you know, a, a, a bold soup so you need a wine that's also got a bit of character to go with it. Yeah, I love that. So you lived in London from 1990 to 2002. Uh, you worked as a sommelier at some pretty interesting restaurants. Can you tell us about that period? Like what took you over there and, and what, what happened um, along the road? Yeah, so I, I sort of just left Australia not really knowing what I wanted to do. And prior to the, the UK, I was living in America. And, uh, and then I um, arrived in the UK thinking I needed to do something with my life and I'd always had an interest. I grew up in Brunswick and we had lots of Italian neighbours and um, they used to make wine from the grapes that hung over our fence. And so I always had a bit of an interest in wine. So I, I um, started working as a junior sommelier in, in London and, and studied for my um, WSET, what was called a diploma then, I think it's called level four now. And then, um, yeah, I was lucky enough to get, land a job in a, some really nice restaurants. And at the time, I think it was a bit unusual to see a non-French sommelier. And so, yeah, I got lucky enough to get headhunted a few times and the career just took off. What were some of the highlights, Troy? Um, I think working at the Square when it was um, still sort of one Michelin star and getting its second Michelin star and being named by Square magazine as the um, best sommelier team in the UK. Um, I was only a junior som, but um, some of the wines we got to open and try there and, and the standard of service and the attention to detail by Phil Howard, the chef, and also the maitre d' was second to none, and I learnt a lot from that. And, you know, you mentioned being an Aussie, and um, I mean, I guess there are plenty of Aussies at the square, um, but what was it like, you know, you must get some pretty high-flying customers. Did you find that you had to, uh, you know, prove yourself a few times? Um, sometimes, yeah, there was a couple of a story where, you know, um, someone didn't want to be served by me because I wasn't French. I mean, <laughs> at, at the time, at the, at the square front of house, it was I was the only non-French person at front of house. Um, and so, yeah, this one customer didn't want to uh, be served by an Australian sommelier, wanted the French sommelier. So, you know, yeah, that was some, only the, that was the one the main one that sort of stuck out, yeah. <laughs> Did you book your ticket to Burgundy the very next day? No, it was it was a little bit later, but um, no. It, and the head sommelier was really nice about it, and um, he was joking that they weren't even French; uh, they were Quebecois. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So. so, one thing that you did that I, I find. It's so interesting is that you wrote the wine list for David Thompson's NAM when it opened. Um, I mean, wine and Thai food, it's like this sort of ongoing puzzle. Uh, tell us how you approached that and how it was received. Yeah, well, at the time, it was quite unusual for um, fine dining Thai to, in, in the UK, in, in London, and people thought I was a bit mad leaving French dining to go and try and be a sommelier at a Thai restaurant that most people think oh, you know, beer and Thai food and mo a lot of people weren't thinking about wine. Um, so I was lucky enough to get involved really early in the process at, at NAM and so I got to spend a lot of time with David Thompson and, and Damien Jones who was his um, sous chef um, in the kitchens and just sort of talking about how they build flavours and how they get balance within Thai food and that really helped with trying to write the wine list and you know things like German Rieslings worked beautifully with them or chilled Pinot to soften the tannins um, so that was really exciting it was um, yeah it was a great restaurant to work for Dave was good fun and hard work but um, yeah it was, it was awesome and you know where did that take you in your career like did you find people were perceived you in a different way once you'd done that yeah, I think so. I, I sort of got the nickname as the German Golden Boy because I was buying more German Riesling than anyone else in the UK at the time. Um, so I think it sort of 
put me in a position of someone who had a was willing to challenge my palate and people's palates. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And what was it that made you want to take the leap from sommelier to winemaker? I'd always had the 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 want to do it. Um, you know, when when you're um, working in London in Michelin starred restaurants, um, there's a lot of you know BS sometimes around wine. And when I ever um, met winemakers, they tended to be just really down to earth farmers and the sort of BS got added in the big cities and I loved that whole process of farming grapes and making wine and it sort of bringing it back to its its realness and sometimes I think in those big fine dining restaurants the realness gets lost maybe. Yeah, well I think that's so true. I've I've really I've also experienced that where you just think well yeah, it's pl- it's plants grown in fields and weather, and yeah, you you, you want to create something beautiful, but you've really got to get your hands dirty along the way. Well, it all starts in a vineyard. Without the, the the fruit, you can't make good wine, you know. And so it's really challenging with the seasons. Um, but that's also what's exciting about it. No two vintages are the same, so you you know you you get to uh, try things out every now and again. And, I mean, it, it seems like a great choice, but why did you land on Burgundy? Was it that you loved that style or was it a particular vineyard you wanted to work at? What, what happened there? I, I really loved um, Pinot and Chardonnay. But what I also found is that there was a little, for, if you're comparing it to Bordeaux, it was still a little bit more um, accessible the people-wise. Like there was still a lot of family-run domains. Um, there was a bit more of that connection to 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 the earth as well. Um, I was, when I was working as a song in London, I was lucky enough to meet, you know, Madame Laflave and talk to her about biodynamics when they were just converting to biodynamics at Domain Laflave and we had a lunch and I got well, I was lucky enough to sit next to her and talk about the philosophies in, of, of biodynamics and I also got to speak to Albert Mann about you know, biodynamics and just I got to meet all these really interesting um, people and I f- kept getting drawn to Burgundy. Um, I really love the wines. I mean, I love Chardonnay and Pinot, and I just thought, yeah, that connection to the uh, the family as well. Family run stuff was a little bit more than, say, Bordeaux. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I mean, what would you say you've been able to take from those experiences to what you're doing at Atwoods now? I think th- that um, the the main one of the main things that I learnt from working in Burgundy is that um, the hardest thing to do in the winery sometimes is nothing and and allow the wine to express itself um, and just trust it. You know, um, you know, sometimes you can taste, you can chase perfection and that's could be boring where if you just allow the wine to be what it's going to be, um, I think that's one of the best things I've learned about working in Berg, yeah, it's just don't uh, don't pr- don't push the wine. Mm. Do you reckon you can taste that in in another wine? Where you, do you reckon it it is perceptible? Like just that, oh, this wine, it's just working too hard. Yeah, I think I think we can overwork a wine and we can polish it that it loses its soul. And I think you can you can taste that in in some wines. I think it it's not that it's a bad wine. It just maybe lacks a little personality, and I think that's maybe from um, over wine making a wine. If that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. I think it's a really it's a it's quite a I don't know. I guess there's a generosity in thinking about that, like that you want to you you're really after that expression, and expression isn't necessarily perfect it can be you know a little loose or dangerous at times yeah well you know it's like people sometimes you know the most interesting people are the ones with the little rough edges right and wine is sometimes the same um if it's super polished it can, it can be nice and tasty but you just think oh yeah that's an okay wine <laughs> do you serve yeah. other wines at your restaurant oh no very selfish and only serve wines i make <laughs> <laughs> i love it 
Troy, how do you balance your time? Because can you can I'm always looking for the answer to this. Um, yeah, like how do you is it is it seasonal seasonally driven or is it you know such and such a day is restaurant day? Like how do you sort of work it all out? Yeah, it's pretty full on at the moment, um, especially since we've had a lot of um, staff shortages in regional Victoria and getting staff around sort of Dalesford can be quite difficult with um, long term rental situations. So at the moment, it's you really struggle trying to get the balance. So Friday through to Monday, I'm normally at cellar door and in the restaurant. And then Tuesday to um, Thursday, sort of winery and vineyard. I um, was lucky enough to get a, uh, an assistant on this year, Luke Polson, and he's taken a, a massive workload off off my hands. It's been a godsend. Though so, um, that's been able to mean I can work on the business as well as working in the business which is sometimes a challenge. And how does Sean go about working, like creating the dishes? Is it something you do together in concert with the wines or is it, yeah? Yeah, we, yeah, we do, especially with uh, things like we do a couple of members' dinners a, a year and um, we'll sit down and um, talk about, um, he'll have an idea of a, a menu for the, for the month and we'll sit down and we'll talk about maybe what wines we think will go with those dishes and... Because, I mean, he's such an amazing chef. We just give him carte blanche. He, he really has the run of the kitchen. I mean, I have no problems with uh, trusting him to, to, to come up with a, a menu. And he, has, he also likes, gets to take our wines home every week and try them. And so he knows our style and, and how our wines taste. So he, I'm sure he has that in mind when he's creating the menu. Wow, sounds like a really wonderful synergy and, and partnership. I mean, it's lovely to hear about you, you know, talking about the way his sources and, you know, the depth and knowledge that's in them. Where do you think we're at in Australia at the moment with an appreciation for those classic techniques? And, and I suppose I'm asking from the point of view of diners, but also from the point of view of the hospitality industry. Yeah, um, well, I can only go with the diners that have come to us and speaking to them. I think the cl- the classics are a classic are classics for reasons. Like they, they're just good, and when they're done with good, great technique and and good ingredients, you can't beat them. Like I think sometimes we we can move away from the classics, and that can be fun and really exciting. But when you want to just come to the mass and ranges when it's cold and winter, you know. Uh, a good coq au vin is a good coq au vin, right? You don't need bells and whistles. Um, you just want hearty, good food and um, with a little bit of finesse. And I think that's what we're trying to do at Le Bouchon is just these classic good dishes executed really well. And I think um, we're seeing that um, more regionally, I think, as well, where people are just trying to um, use good local ingredients. I wonder if regional, when people come to a regional restaurant it is like perhaps life has slowed down at least for that day or, or that weekend and perhaps that is a really nice scenario to appreciate some of those those classic techniques you know a, a, a stock that takes three days to make or, or whatever it is um I don't know because I feel like a lot of people um I don't know maybe when things are all at pace perhaps it's harder to take the time to appreciate the depth in something yeah I think that's really a good point I think we get people who have, you know, we're not far from Hepburn Springs and Dalesford, so people come to, and they're getting spa treatments and massages and they're really slowing down and relax. So we, we can have a longer s- service. There's not a, a rush. It's not like you've got to come in and you're eating within an hour because you're on your lunch break or you, you're off to the theatre later. You, you know, this is the thing you're doing for today. And I think people start to appreciate that, that, that style of food as well with lots of flavour without the trickery mm. and I mean you mentioned well you know you've got this facility with matching with Thai food like are there any wines of yours that you think work well um, with uh, yeah perhaps Asian cuisine or some other um, spiced cuisine yeah well I think things like our, we, our Van der Folly range work really well with Thai food we do we have Van der Folly Rouge which we serve chilled and chilled red goes quite nicely with with spice so you just want to it softens the tannins and makes it more fruit driven. I think that sort of wine works really well with Thai food. Mm. Um, and uh, I think I was, you know, ch- chilled reds certainly are having a moment. Am I allowed to have chilled red in winter as well? 
I think the only rule to wine that counts is drink what you like. So if you like chilled red, drink it whenever you like, right? Um, <laughs> I don't think there's, you know, there's no real rules. It's what wherever you like, and you know, I, you know, you can drink, you can drink a Pinot on a summer's day or a Shiraz on a summer's day. Doesn't so you should be able to drink a chilled red in winter. All right, I'm loving the permission that you're giving me there, Troy. Um, what do you like? What's the landscape like for small winemakers at the moment? Do you feel like it's an an exciting time, or is it a very challenging time? I think there's a bit of both. I, I think it's exciting, but I think it's uh, with the current economy, it can be, and you're competing for people's ever reducing you know, spare dollar. So I think that's the challenge. Uh, challenge, but I think we're really lucky in Victoria, especially that. Um, there's so many great small wineries and they're all really passionate people doing some great things. And I think it's a really exciting time where people are starting, I think it's been happening for a while, looking for not only food, food and wine, but pro- things of provenance. And they want to hear that, you know, see the vineyard and how you're farming. That people have a real interest in that. It's not just they don't want to go to a, a big chained um, liquor store and buy the cheapest bottle of wine they want to come out when they're out with us they want to know the story and how the how long it takes to make a bottle of wine um that it still surprises some people that you know harvest is only once a year you know um it's and it's a real learning curve and people are really interested i I think it's a quite an exciting time oh i love that um yeah, it's so important for sommeliers and winemakers to be able to take people on that journey and I guess meet them wherever they're starting from. Um, it's certainly something I appreciate in restaurants. Um, so maybe to, maybe to round off our chat, Troy, I'm going to ask you a question from the perspective, uh, well, because as a sommelier, but then uh, also from the perspective of a diner. So what do you reckon... If you were training a sommelier, what would be the bedrock things that you would tell them they just had to be? And I don't mean about wine knowledge. I mean about dealing with people. Like what do you think really makes a good sommelier? I think it's understanding that different people are at different parts of their journey in wine and not everyone, not a lot of people know or everyone knows a lot about wine, but they might have an interest. And, you know, when I was a junior som and you're working at a, on a, in a restaurant and you've got a wine list that – starts at 20 pounds and goes up to 15,000 pounds. It's like, how do you when how do you pitch that? And I found the best question I ever asked was, what do you normally like? And that gives you style and it gives you price. And then you can, it's not about me giving someone a wine that I like. It's about trying to recommend a wine that they, they would like. I think that's a really important thing is that you can ask someone, do you, oh, you want to try something a bit different? And then you can take them like, 10 degrees off what they normally drink so they still like it rather than taking them 180 degrees and you might love that Jura Chardonnay that doesn't but doesn't mean that someone who's new to wine will understand it so don't give that to them don't recommend that sort of wine so try and gauge where they're at in their wine journey and I always found that yeah asking what do you normally drink was a really good way of finding that out. Mm. And so from the customer point of view, um, what do you, what are some do's and don'ts in how to chat to sommeliers? Like how can you get the best out of that engagement? I think it's about being honest and, and saying, hey, I really like this style of wine and we're looking at a wine at this price point and trying to take the, the stigma and the scariness away. So, yeah, just trying to be honest with your sommelier and that way you'll get the best service. Um Sommeliers aren't trying, or people in restaurants aren't trying to rip you off and get the most amount of money out of you. They're trying to get let you have the best dining experience you can have. And if you um, are honest with them or and can talk to them and say, "Hey, yeah, I really love Chardonnay. I'm thinking about spending between eighty and a hundred dollars, or whatever it is that suits your budget," then the som can will. When I was a som, and I'm sure it's the same now. You, that's a challenge. Well, I'm going to give them the best wine at that price. They'll, they'll want them to think, wow, that was awesome. You know, um, so I think, yeah, if you just be honest with the, with the song and what you like, what you want to spend, um, and that way there's no surprises and you have a great experience and the song will have a good experience if you really enjoy the wine. Yeah. I mean, it is nice, I suppose, if you're feeling a bit adventurous to just 
let the Somme decide, put it in, put it in their hands. Um, I've yeah, certainly learned a lot about about wine, but perhaps also about what I do and sometimes don't like when I've done that. But I suppose, yeah, it's all about, um, I suppose I was feeling like being adventurous. So, so I was honest about that. Yeah. And then you, if you say, hey, I'm feeling a little bit adventurous, but I love wines with acid and then bang. And then, or, you know, uh, I like wine with ta- good tannin structure or whatever it is. And then you can get introduced to something new. I mean, I think part of it, if you're lucky enough to go to a restaurant that has a, a som, you know, don't. Part of the excitement is maybe trying something a little bit different. But again, as the som, you want to make sure you're not taking them too far off their normal track. And but, you know, just giving them a little taste of something a bit unusual. Yeah, love it. Um, so Troy, finally, it's coming into winter. Um, in the in the ranges um tell us what it's looking like there and um yeah is it it's beautiful time of year autumn out our way you know it's all those lovely autumnal colors that are um take filling the fields and the the streets with all the so it's a lovely time of year it's one of my favorite times of year and it's just starting to cool down so getting those crisp nights putting on start lighting fires and um yeah it's beautiful this time of year and getting ready for um pruning yeah, well, you do the pruning and I'll hit the highway and come for some of that onion soup. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks so much for chatting today, Troy. Great to catch up. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Danny. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.